Thank you, Madam President. First of all, I would like to extend my condolences to you because under your presidency, we have just wasted two hours discussing the format of this meeting and have agreed that only three countries would speak in the open format. Mr. Eliasson, my Ukrainian counterpart, Ambassador Sergeyev, and the permanent representative of the Russian Federation. It seems that some of our colleagues in the Security Council are already prepared to violate this understanding. But what can you do when a free-for-all starts? I would like to thank Mr. Eliasson for his briefing and support for what he said in conclusion, that now is the time for cool heads to prevail. Unfortunately, I have to say that my Ukrainian counterpart failed to heed this call, and his speech included a few terms which we certainly cannot agree with as a description of the situation in Ukraine and the steps the Russian Federation is taking. Colleagues, we are discussing here a crisis which should never have happened. There were absolutely no reasons for it. Ukrainians have always been our brothers. Let's look back at the situation last autumn. Ukraine has a legitimate democratically elected president, Viktor Yanukovych, backed by a majority in the democratically elected parliament. Ukraine does face some serious economic challenges. The Ukrainian authorities have some serious decisions to make. For instance, they have to decide whether to sign the EU Association Agreement. This is a tough decision. Perhaps the biggest mistake by the Ukrainian authorities was that until the very last moment they did not realise that the Association Agreement Brussels offered them would have a very negative effect on their economy. Under these circumstances, the Ukrainian authorities Specifically, President Yanukovych made a totally constitutional decision that any government can make not to sign the EU Association Agreement at that point. As they have said repeatedly, this does not mean they completely abandoned the idea of European integration. They just wanted to consider the situation carefully. I repeat, the Ukrainian authorities were fully authorised to make this decision. So the question is, why take this issue to the level of street protests? The question is, why support all those street protests from abroad? Why would EU politicians support them? Why would parliamentary speakers from some EU nations address protesters, encouraging them to continue opposing this decision by the Ukrainian authorities? Why would certain government officials walk around Independence Square, handing out buns and posing next to opposition leaders? Why interfere so blatantly into the internal affairs of a sovereign? nation. One more question. In the course of the crisis, President Yanukovych, I don't justify his actions because naturally there is a lot you can criticise him for, but I am just reviewing the facts, offered the position of Prime Minister to one of the opposition leaders, Mr Yatsenyuk. Why wasn't this offer accepted? Why continue to escalate tensions? Mr Yatsenyuk could have formed the government. He could have signed an association agreement with the EU, and then he would have been responsible for the catastrophic economic consequences of this agreement. And then, after a short period of time, in early 2015, they would hold a presidential election. And if the people of Ukraine or the opposition didn't like, didn't like Mr Yanukovych, they could have elected somebody else. This has happened before in Ukraine's history. Ukraine had situations where Mr Yanukovych lost elections and Ukraine had other presidents. Why continue to escalate tensions? Why do some of our Western counterparts want this confrontation to continue? Why put armed militants on the street? Why would these armed militants throw Molotov cocktails and rocks at police? Why make police officers burn? Have you heard these politicians in the West who are so desperate to see a democratic Ukraine directly condemn these actions? We haven't heard a single clear statement from all those countless institutions that care about democracy so much. What is then the purpose of their existence if they don't respond to this kind of behaviour? Eventually, as this crisis developed, an agreement was signed on February 21st. It was signed by President Yanukovych and the opposition. It was also signed by the foreign ministers of three countries, Germany, France and Poland. This was a very important agreement, and even though the crisis was at an advanced stage, it offered a way out of this situation. According to this agreement, a national unity government was to be formed in 10 days and a constitutional reform was to be implemented. After adopting the constitution, a presidential election was to be held no later than December 2014. The authorities and the opposition promised not to use violence, 
and all the people who were not authorized to carry weapons were supposed to lay down their arms. Why wasn't this agreement implemented? Why did President Yanukovych have to face threats, as a result of which he had to leave Kiev? Why was the first decision the new RADA made, after all these painful events, a decision to repeal the law on languages? This law was adopted after a long political process and gave certain rights to minorities, and not just to the Russian minority, by the way. Why would they make such a decision on the very first day? Because this was not a political coalition, not a political process. This was what one of the opposition leaders described as a government of victors. In other words, this was a political group. I won't go now into discussions of whether it was a small group or a large group, imposing its will on other people. And we know that these groups which have seized power include some extreme radicals, and they have now been put in charge of Ukraine's security. I would like to speak now about the developments that took place over the last few days, which are the reason for our meeting here. Over the last few days and hours, there has been a serious escalation in Crimea, as well as in the eastern parts of Ukraine in general, since the agents from Kiev have operated in the eastern areas of Ukraine, and especially in Crimea, demonstrating a clear intention to do there what they have already done in Kiev. And it is known that they have already overthrown the local authorities in the western parts of Ukraine under the same intentions. Naturally, it caused deep concern in the Autonomous Republic of Crimea, and it was under these circumstances that the chairman of the Council of Ministers of Crimea, Sergei Aksyonov, made the statement that was mentioned today by Mr. Eliasson. I shall quote this statement to you. Quote, Despite the agreements that have been reached with the central authorities that stipulated that no governing officials shall be appointed to any of the security, defence or law enforcement agencies without obtaining prior consent of the Supreme Council of the Autonomous Republic of Crimea, yesterday, on February 28th, Igor Avrutsky was appointed to be the head of the militia of Crimea, which constitutes a breach of the constitution of the Autonomous Republic of Crimea and the laws of Ukraine, including the Ukrainian law law on militia. This appointment and the presence of unidentified armed groups and military machinery, together with the inability of the security, defence or law enforcement contingent deployed in Crimea to efficiently control the situation in the Republic, has triggered unrest and clashes with the use of firepower. End quote. Now I shall quote the statement issued today by the Russian Foreign Ministry. Quote, On the night of March the 1st, unidentified armed people acting on orders from Kiev attempted to take over the building of the Ministry of Internal Affairs of the Autonomous Republic of Crimea. This treacherous provocation has resulted in a number of victims. Thanks to the resolved actions of the Community Defence Volunteer Squads, this attempt to take over the ministry building was repelled. This event is confirmation that the political circles in Kiev are trying to destabilise the situation in Crimea. We are calling for those who give such orders in Kiev to restrain themselves. We consider actions leading to further escalation of the situation in Crimea, which is already tense enough to be completely irresponsible. End quote. These are the circumstances under which the chairman of the Council of Ministers of Crimea, Sergei Aksyonov, addressed the Russian president asking for help and assistance in restoring order in Crimea. According to the reports we have received, this appeal was supported by Viktor Yanukovych, who we believe was dismissed from power in an illegal way. In compliance with the Russian constitutional procedures, the President of Russia responded to this address by submitting the following appeal to the Council of Federation. Quote, in view of an extraordinary situation that has developed in Ukraine and the existing threat to the lives of the citizens of the Russian Federation, including the military contingent of the Russian armed forces deployed on the territory of Ukraine in Crimea, based on the international agreement and in compliance with the Article 102, Part 1, Clause G of the Constitution of the Russian Federation, I am submitting this appeal to the Federation Council of the Federal Assembly of the Russian Federation requesting permission to use the armed forces forces of the Russian Federation on the territory of Ukraine until the political and overall stabilization of the situation in Ukraine is achieved." End quote. I would like to draw your attention to the wording on the territory of Ukraine. 
not against Ukraine, as my Ukrainian colleague has said, but on the territory of Ukraine until the political and overall stabilization of the situation in Ukraine is achieved. And according to recent reports that I have, including the statement made by the spokesman of the president of the Russian Federation, no decision has yet been made by the Russian president to use the Russian armed forces on the territory of Ukraine. So how do we look for a solution to this situation? I would like to refer again to the words of Mr. Eliasson. We need to keep our heads cool. We need to steer the process back onto the political track and within the scope of the constitutional framework. We need to go back to the agreement of February 21st and to the task of creating a government of national unity and all attempts to interact with the opponents, whether policies or ethnical, via the use of force, must be stopped. The international parties who have an elevated interest in the situation in Ukraine need to restrain the radical forces there and to recommend all the Ukrainian opposition activists who are now located in Kiev to stay away from the radicals and not to let the latter get the upper hand in Ukraine, as such actions could lead to disastrous consequences, which is something that the Russian Federation is trying to prevent from happening. Thank you, Madam President.